And the analysis now of Shields and Brooks, that is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello to both of you. Uh, 21st day, uh, Mark, of the shutdown it is. Um, you could say we're, we're, we're right where we were a week or two ago, but the difference is that the president went to the border. The president uh, had an Oval Office address where he made his case. Uh, he was, uh, the Democrats responded to him. Are we hearing arguments from either side that would give them the upper hand, or are we just stuck in this stalemate forever? Uh, well, I hope, I hope we're not stuck here forever, Judy, but uh, I'd say that there's not an upper hand, but the, the lower hand is held by the president. I mean, not that the Democrats are, are celebrating or, or spiking the ball in the end zone, or they have any reason to, but the, the president, you mentioned the speech he gave, uh, which he acknowledged uh, to press people on a background basis before the speech. He was doing it reluctantly under duress from his communications director and Kellyanne Conway going to the border reluctantly. And the speech came across as somebody who was just going through the motions. Uh, it was done with no conviction, no passion, no intensity, and, and I think very little persuasiveness to it. The, the difference uh, in the relationship right now is that Paul Ryan of Wisconsin is no longer Speaker. Nancy Pelosi of California is. And the, the difference, I think, is that uh, he's being called out on facts, which have, did not happen in the first two years of his presidency. When he says there's a flood of people coming across, it's the lowest it's been in 46 years. Um, you know, she calls him out on that. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a changed relationship. But I don't think this is the greatest hit for the Democrats, and especially the rebuttal of Pelosi and, and Chuck Schumer. I mean, it was staged by somebody from uh, runaway road edition of the American <laughs> Gothic, and uh, they looked uncomfortably close together, mm -hmm. and I didn't think it, it particularly worked. But I, I'd say that the Republicans and Donald Trump are very much on the defensive and remaining there. David, you see either side making a better argument? Yeah, I hear like a, a, this strange two-track phenomenon that's going on. Apparently at the under level, they're actually having normal negotiations. The, the Repu Republicans are asking for $5.7 billion for the wall. They know they're not going to get that. They're like thinking maybe we can get three. Uh, the Democrats are thinking, well, in point three, uh, and, but, and maybe we should go up to two. The Republicans are hoping they get up to two. And so it's a normal negotiation like you're buying a house. Uh, and that sounds like a normal negotiation. And if it was that, they could get to two, uh, and Trump could walk away with some money to wall. It wouldn't be that much, uh, and that would we'd just be done with this. And it's crazy that they're arguing that they're shutting the government over a, you know several hundred million dollars. At the ego level, which is the Pelosi-Trump level, you have an entirely different set of situations where it's not a normal negotiation over money. It's an absolutist ego position, my way or zero, and. One sees the underlevel negotiations happening, but then constantly being crushed by the ego level. So, for example, uh, this week, a bunch of Republican senators, had, with Lindsey Graham's involvement, tried to propose another solution that DACA. the Trump could accept, uh, that we talked about last week, which would be DACA, uh, Path to Citizenship, for some money for the wall. The children. Oh. And the White House apparently signaled to them, no, we're not going for that deal. So the Republicans didn't want to get in front of their own White House, so they never proposed the deal. Similarly, a lot of moderate Democrats would love a deal, but they don't want to get out in front of Nancy Pelosi. So we've right now got two towers of ego who can't give, and a lot of other people trying to do something in the middle with that not much effect. I, I, I take exception to the two towers of ego. I mean, uh, let, let's get very blunt. I mean, if, if the Republicans cared about the wall, they had co total control of the federal government for two years. And what did they do in those two years? They repealed but didn't replace pre-existing condition uh, for health care. They repealed the Affordable Care Act, uh, tried mightily to do so. They passed a tax cut, uh, which will uh, it, it has actually reduced federal revenues, uh, we just learned this week, uh, in spite of the fa fact that the economy has grown by 3 percent. The last time the economy grew by almost 3 percent, tax revenues were up 7 percent. Uh, but because of the structuring of it uh, by this administration and what it cares about, and for some reason, Donald Trump and his advisors thought, well, it'll be easier to deal with Nancy Pelosi uh, than it would uh, the Democratic majority in the Congress than it was with Paul Ryan. Now, where did this come from? Where did they ever get that idea? So, I mean, to me, 
it, it, the, the fault is on the on the Republican side. What they cared about was the tax cut. What they cared about was repeal, repealing the Affordable Care Act. I mean, that was that was those were their priorities. What about? Well, don't ask me to give a linear uh, <laughs> description of Donald Trump's brain, <laughs> what it's <laughs> thinking at any moment. But he he should have fought this fight obviously when the Republicans there. If he really cared about the wall, he should have cared about the wall. Yeah. I think he was prompted by what he sees as the crisis on the border by all the families which we saw earlier in the show coming across the border, mm -hmm. and so suddenly he got hyped up about all this. But given where we are, uh, you know, he won an election running on the wall. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi won an election running on DACA. So this, to me, is not that complicated. Uh, you come, both those sides come together and offer that proposal. And Nancy Pelosi doesn't give him $5 billion on the wall, but she gives him $2 billion. And we can have an actual government. And to me, that's, that's a deal that just seems so obvious. But Trump is not going there. And, and what everyone thinks of the merits of Pelosi's position, and I'm not a fan of the wall, but let's get this done with it. You got two parties come to an agreement. And you've got 800,000 federal employees who are not getting paid and, and an increasing ripple effect on the American people. No, you do. And, and uh, let's be very blunt. The, the late Bob Teeter, who was a Republican pollster and a, a, a strategist and a, a very admirable human being, once said the American people are philosophically conservative, but they're operationally liberal. And by that, he simply meant you ask people how they feel about the federal government, it's a pain in the neck. Too much red tape, get them off my back, out of my life. However, when told that a single can of tuna fish has been discovered in Pocatello, Idaho, with a trace of botulism in it, there's a universal American reaction is, where the hell was the federal government? And I want to know, I want to report on my office in 24 hours. We, we want this energetic, small, efficient federal government working on our side 24 hours a day cheap. And the, the fact is that right now, I mean, we're, we're looking at 40 million Americans who depend on food stamps to put food on the table for their family. Uh, we're talking about children who go to school who need the expanded health care uh, and, and uh, 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 school lunch program. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about women's and infant care. I mean, we're, we're heading toward, and quite conceivably, the Food and Drug Administration being underfunded. We could have some sort of a, a, a breakout of, of disease or, or infection. I mean, so... And airline safety. And which airline we were safety as well. Tonight. So, I mean, you know, I, I just, I really think that th this is this is pretty serious stuff and uh, which which I don't think has been accepted and acknowledged by the president but if that's the case David why I mean where are rational minds in all this I mean it, it's well, a, it's a spectacle still. well I think the, the leaders are are both uh, seeing all the people who are upset by this and they know they're paying a price but they're more afraid of the on both sides on, I think on both sides Donald Trump probably has more conviction, but... Uh, uh, what conviction, then? Well, he has more... He believes in his own propaganda, probably a little more than that. Do you really? Nancy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right, man. You know, I accept your sincerity on it. I just, it's your perception. I think he fervently thinks he's serving... Them, or he thinks there's some threat. He, he believes in the position. But I think they're also afraid... They've walked themselves up to a spot where it's hard for them to corrupt to actually make a deal, because they've both been so absolutist. Nancy Pelosi said the wall was immoral. Mm -hmm. Trump says we're under threat from the whole world coming to get us. Uh, and so they've built these barriers uh, of absolutism around their position. Uh, I, you know, I, I look at this whole thing, and I think, you know, we're the country that defeated fascism. Like, we fought a World War II. That was sort of a complicated thing we had to pull off. Uh, you go back to the 60s, all the great society legislation. I was even looking in the 70s today. Ted Kennedy and the Republicans got together to deregulate airlines. Right. And we just have a history of taking for granted a level of professional craftsmanship in our legislators. And we don't have anything like that now. And that's been a long process over many, de uh, de many decades that just the level of skill of crafting legislation has been in slow, gradual decline, and now we're at a nadir. Well, the, John, Donald, Donald Trump may over. believe it, but he's wrong. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I just, I, I don't fault the Democrats for correcting him. When he says that this, the drugs are flooding across the southern border, 90 percent of illegal drugs that come into this country come in through legal, legal. legal ports, according to, to the Drug Enforcement Agency of the United States. But Julie. that hasn't stopped the administration from making that argument. That's what I mean. I mean, so, you know, I, sincerity is one thing, stupidity is another, or, I or willful ignorance. It's like, I agree with you, but this is not a debating society. This is politics. In politics, they win an election on opposition. You got to have... Some, and they have some power. You have some power. You reach a grill. You I, can't just say you're wrong. No, it's not I, really no, good I, negotiating but I mean, strategy. He just lost an election, 40, 40 House seats on the caravan. 
All right? right. The caravan turned out to be not, not the great threat, not the marauding invasion there was. There is no caravan now, and he's still trying to sell the same bill of goods. I mean, at some point, you're going to say, hey, pal. You know, maybe we could work it out. They did have a compromise, David, as you know, before Christmas until Ann and Rush intervened and said, Donnie, you're not being tough enough. The conservative uh, yes. talk, show, talk show host. Two minutes uh, less Sorry. or less that we have left. And we're going to much more uplifting subject, the okay. Mueller Russia investigation. <laughs> David, there were a couple of developments this week. We now know the president's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, is going to testify before Congress. And in a surprising move, it turns out that uh, Paul Manafort, former campaign chairman for the president, uh, his lawyers had a piece of paper in their filing that disclosed that Paul Manafort shared election campaign polling data with Russians. Um, what, what are we to think about this? I hate it when incompetence ruins corruption. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> they, um, well, we've, we've learned a few more things. First, the Cohen thing would be interesting, I think not for any Russia angles, but because Cohen was Trump's fixer uh, for a long time. And so there's all sorts of stories about, about playmates and other things that Cohen has access to. So that'll be, that'll be a week of our life. <laughs> we'll be dedicated to analyzing that. But the Mueller thing is just, it's like a, a growing algae or something. It's just, there's always something new here. And it's, none of it is like a killer impeachable events. But when you see all the Ukrainians were, who were heavily involved in the inauguration, who came, who paid a lot of money, these were the same oligarchs, the pro-Russia thing, uh, who Manafort met with. They had a vested interest in some sort of lifting of the sanctions. 20 seconds, 25 seconds. 25 seconds, Judy. In 25 seconds, I would say the following. Um, the Mueller investigation was initially about Russian intrusion intervention in the, in the election of 2016. And... Both David and I, I think, were, were a little skeptical about it, uh, more than a little skeptical about it. And if anything, the evidence just keeps building. I mean, this is back now to the mandate that Mueller had, which was Russian intervention, and we're finding out about Russian intervention. We're going to find out uh, about whether it, the, the information went to, polling information went on Michigan and, and uh, Pennsylvania uh, and uh, Wisconsin. We uh, we, we got a peek at it this week, and we're we got a peek at peaks. it this week, and, gonna... and Michael Cohen will be the John Dean of this generation. <laughs> Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you.